No idea the amount of trouble I had getting through that mirror just now. I'd have three goes. Well, welcome all of you to Looking Glass House. For the short while you're here, you are my guests on the other side of that mirror you've seen for such a long time. I hope that you'll enjoy discovering this new experience, new for us, but the experience that Lewis Carroll described in The Real Alice many years ago. We are going to do experiments that I hope will help you to discover more about this mystery that we call three-dimensional space. If I hold an object in my left hand and I turn and face a mirror, the man there holds the notes in his right hand. Why is this? If your left becomes your right, why doesn't your head become your feet? The question has been asked many times and various answers have been given. The first guess is because you've got a front and a back. You face the mirror, the front of you is one foot in front of the mirror. So the image of that button is one foot the other side of the mirror. But the back of me here is two feet from the mirror, so that will appear two feet behind the mirror. You seem to have simply a front-back inversion. It was all so easy, wasn't it? Well now that explanation only goes half of the way because there are two ways in which you can mentally put yourself in the position of the chap behind the mirror. I can't do the gymnastics this young fellow can do, so I'll show you with him. He sees himself in the mirror, and what he sees mentally is that he's done a little walk around here to there, and that's how he sees himself. So what he's done is to rotate himself about a vertical line. He's done a vertical spin but he could still have made himself faces if he'd taken a dive over the top. You see now why I didn't do it for real. He's still facing you, but of course he's wrong side up. So apparently you can reverse head and feet mentally, but somehow you don't in the mirror. Now, I'm going to try and show you why it should be that one axis is preferred to the other. And the answer is that because, as well as a front and a back, you have learned, through gravity, how to have a top and a bottom. We are asymmetric this way, as well as front and back. Now, this is a little disturbing, because if I take a cylinder and do the same with this as I did with this dummy, the cylinder doesn't mind whether it goes around the mirror that way, or whether it goes over the top this way, it finishes up looking the same. Unless, I were to stick a, a different colour on the top, because this doesn't have a top and a bottom, even though it looks as if it does. So, with the aid of some arrows, I'll try and show you the mysteries of reflection, perhaps as you'd not thought of them before. If I hold a plain arrow in front of the mirror, then you can't tell that it's any different in the mirror. In both cases, the arrow is pointing from right to left. It has a front and a back, but the mirror is the same. If I turn it like that, it looks just the same. But, if I turn it like that, then the one in, inside this looking glass house is pointing outwards, and the one on the other side in the real world is coming in. So there is an inversion which you don't get either there or there. This is because the arrow has a front and a back, but it doesn't have a top and a bottom, because that's the same as that. Let's give it a top and a bottom. This one's got a top and a bottom. The top is one colour and the bottom's another. You look at it in the mirror there and you're surprised to find that it doesn't look any different. 
It's the same arrow. Now it isn't. Because now you're looking from back to front and the one colour that's on your right is on your left in the mirror. So somewhere in between it seems to have sort of flipped over, doesn't it? This is the strange thing. Left right there with front back, but no left right there because it is a thing of no thickness. Now this is a cheat. I'm apparently showing you the same arrow again. Oh my. <laughs> what have we done there? Well, we've done the same again. No, oh, that's very different. That's got top bottom reversal and it's got left right reversal as well. And it's got no thickness. But as you know, we've painted the sides differently. <laughs> now we'll take away the point and the feathers. And look at that. That's got a top bottomness. It looks the same in the mirror. What's more, it looks the same in the mirror now. Because we've taken the front and back away. And yet it still has a left rightness, you see. It's left with that. The worst one of all, in a sense, is the double-headed arrow. I may hold it that way, I may hold it that way, and I might even hold it that way, and it looks the same in the mirror. Because it doesn't have a front and a back, it doesn't have any thickness, it doesn't have any left-right. Well, now, I don't know whether those inanimate objects uh, helped you, or whether they made it more difficult. But if they made you think about it, whether you are now more confused than when you came in or not, I think it's a good thing if it's made you think about mirrors perhaps a little more than you did before. Symmetry, you know, is seldom taught to scientists in school. It certainly wasn't in my day. Uh, to artists, yes. But I understand that a lot more teaching of symmetry as a subject is now on the increase in many schools, and this is good. You see, you should be able to look at this abominable creation that one of my family, I confess, drew on the front of your programs. You should be able to look at that and say at once, what is the minimum number of lines that you have to change in order to make it conform to our three-dimensional interpretation of what is, after all, only a two-dimensional perspective drawing. If you can do that at once, you have learnt something that many people have missed in a whole lifetime. Let us now think about uh, animate things. I've got a monster to show you. Thank you, Bill. Welcome, monster. This monster is got a superficial resemblance to a spider, but his legs are not the same because this chap's legs are made for running in any direction equally. He says, I am free from all your troubles. I have no left and no right. I have no front and no back. I've got a single eye in the middle on the top. I can see all of you at once. I've got a single ear at the bottom. I can hear all of you at once. <laughs> and you can't fool me, he says, in front of this mirror. You turn me around as you will, I shall look the same. No front, no back. He's got a top and bottom. I said, monster, climb up the mirror for me. And monster tries to climb up the mirror and finds all of a sudden that he's not symmetrical. He realises now he's got a front-back reversal because his top and bottom have become his front and back. I hope that last demonstration has perhaps helped to clear up a thing or two for you. Now, can we then do top-bottom symmetry on ourselves? I'd like the help of a young volunteer, somebody small like one of you three. You'll have difficulty getting out, love. Would, would you like to come and help me? want you to get on this trolley, we'll give you a small ride. Come in here. That's it. Can you climb on there? I'll help you up. That's it, get my leg up. Oh, you're the way around. He's got with his feet there. Turn, turn over. <laughs> That's it. Now lie down flat. Now we've got somebody reversed top-bottom, as it were, because like the monster, he's now facing into the mirror. And the question is, has he inverted left-right? Lift up your left hand. The boy in the mirror has got his right hand in the air. So although he now suffers a top-bottom reversal, he still retains his left-right reversal as well. Thank you very much. Leap down. All right, thank you.
Now there's another way in which we could get a top-bottom reversal and that's by standing underneath a mirror. Uh, here comes the mirror underneath which I shall stand. <laughs> it is a beautiful mirror. It weighs less than an ounce, the actual mirror material. And if I stand underneath it, I suffer the same effects as our friend, in that if I hold up my right hand, the man in the mirror holds up his left. There appears to be no escape from this left-right inversion. Um, yeah. Well, as they say, there goes my image once again. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Very special. Very special material, this mirror stuff. Aluminium sprayed onto a polyester in, in vacuum, evaporated on, and a sheet of it looks much more like the ripples you see in water than a piece of metal that we're more accustomed to. Now, Mr. Harry Worth used to start off some of his programs by using a shop window in the manner of a mirror. He used to stand like this and get himself lined up absolutely in the center. And then he would perform a trick something like, are we there? Is better, yep. Thank you. You look in the monitor to see if I've got it right. Now, Harry Worth used to do this. But, uh, <laughs> my favourite scientific author, Martin Gardner, did better than Harry Worth. He suggested two other tricks, which I'm going to show you. Line up again. Here is trick one. Fear not, the worst is yet to come. <laughs> get myself just right for this. And they bring me into close-up, get my face nice and symmetrical like that. Now, here we go. Can you see my eyes? <laughs> Isn't that a very dreadful thing? <laughs> It's a very dreadful thing to do to any man, isn't it? Now, some animals respond to a mirror. Birds will try and fight their image. Budgery guys will talk to their image. We have a, a live fellow with us today because I think this chap doesn't care a rap about a mirror. Come on, fella. Oh, there's a doggy. Up on the stage. What about that fellow in there? He doesn't care about that fellow in there. What about that lot out there? Yeah. What about this fellow behind you standing in this mirror? Him. He's not real, is he? You don't want to know about him. <laughs> he says, if, if the mirror smells of something, I'm interested, but not otherwise. He doesn't, he knows that it's not real in some strange way. Martin Gardner suggested that we were not unlike cats and dogs in this respect. We took mirrors for granted, which is more than can be said against our friends, the chimpanzees. We're now going to show you a film of a chimp and a mirror. He has a look at it, and he says, oh, look at that. He says, where's that other fellow behind? He's not there. Let's have another look. He's there now. He matches around the other side. No, he's not. He feels for him. No, he's not there. Goodness. I must tell my mates about this. Here, come and see this. Yeah. <laughs> Look. I can see him. He's moving. Look. I'm going to have a bite. I'm off. I don't like this other fella. <laughs> Oh, I've had enough of that. Is he following me? <laughs> Is he? 
How many of us take that much trouble to worry about whether there's a fellow behind the mirror or not? When we're very small, perhaps we did, but we don't any longer. And as I said, we've been able to baffle one another ever since. Well now, do we ever see ourselves as we really are? And the answer is, of course we do. When we look at photographs of ourselves, or if we've got home movies, or if we're on television. But mostly, we see that bloke in the mirror when you're having a shave in the morning, or when you get up and you think, ooh, yeah. <laughs> and you get accustomed to that, and you find it difficult to get out of that fella being you. Well, of course, he's not. So now you have a chance to do this for yourselves, because I'm going to ask one of the cameras to scan around the audience. Watch the monitors. If you see yourself on one of the monitors, then do something left-righted. Uh, close one eye, or raise one eyebrow if you're capable, or lift up your right hand as the camera sweeps around the audience. Someone there, lift up their right hand, touch the right ear, and make sure that it is really the person that you're actually seeing with the left right hand, you see? They will now know, you now know that you are the real person that's being seen up there and not your photograph. And now for a rather nasty shock. This says, I am not a mirror, and it means what it says. It is, in fact, a transparent sheet, like glass, and just a piece of white card behind it, but there are black letters on the sheet. And the thing is, what will you see when you reveal that to the mirror? The answer is, you will see the same again. Can you see the two images? The lettering is the right way round in both. This is one of the oddest things I shall show you this afternoon. This thing, you see, it has a flatness. If I could use a phrase, it has a lack of front and backness. And that's what that experiment shows. Once again, my favourite author, Martin Gardner, turned the symmetry of certain capital letters into an amusing party trick, very right at this time of year. Uh, a certain brand of American cigarettes called Camel have on the side of the box the words choice quality. Now, Martin Gardner pointed out that being wrapped in cellophane, he said cellophane has a very odd property in that it will reverse a thing, make it upside down. So that if I show you the choice quality in the mirror, if we can come onto this big, you will see, or should see, that the word choice, there we are, out there, can you see him now? Yep. Look at the word choice quality. Choice is all right because it's under the cellophane. Quality out in the open has gone upside down. <laughs> I'll let you think about that and um, we'll come back to it. And meanwhile, uh, here's a, another puzzle for you. Um, in the form of a code. That could be a sequence of words or Chinese characters or something. And if it is, it's a sequence from your left to right, maybe a word or a combination of words. The question is, what are the next two symbols in the series? If you haven't seen it before, you're not likely to get it in a few seconds. We'll leave it there. And we'll come back to that again also. Well, now I'll break the spell of the mirror. I'll stop this left-right inversion. And I'm going to ask one of you to experience this. Because we're going to put two mirrors at right angles. And I want one of you to come and see yourself as you really are. Volunteer. Yes. Uh, just before you go there, I, I'm just going to do a little experiment with you. It didn't hurt. You'll see what it's all about in a minute. I'm putting a coloured spot on one on each cheek. And she's going to look at herself in the mirror. Can you see? Yeah. I want you to put your hand up and touch the red spot. Yeah, she didn't make it, did she? He. He, sorry. <laughs> I 
I am mortified. It is so difficult. Let's have another go. Now, let's get you in close-up and get you exactly right so that the rest of them can see. You come at this bit this way. We need a box, I think, Bill. Just a little step. <coughs> can you lower that down? Oh, great. We'll have a better look at that. All right. Now, can we see it? Now, it's a little bit to me. Right. We've got you in close-up now. Can I just swivel the mirror a bit? That's better. Okay. Now, I hope they can see which cheek's got the red spot and which got the blue. Now, you used your right hand that time, didn't you? Yeah. Use your left this time and touch the red spot. You managed it this time because you knew, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> now, just so that... I'll take these off for you. Just so that we're absolutely sure that uh, this really is difficult, can I have, this time, a young lady volunteer? Yes. You won't need... Now, you don't know which cheek I'm going to put them on. I'm going to put them low down so you can't see. All right, now you look at yourself in the mirror. Let me position you in respect to the camera. Get a bit lower if you can. Let me see if I can adjust you. No, a bit that way. A bit lower. There you are. Right, now we can all see you. Now touch the red spot. <laughs> Get a surprise? Yes. I mean, there you are. Thank you very much. Now I've got a surprise, one more surprise for a young fella. I think we need to lift it a bit, Bill. Somebody uh, perhaps a little taller this time. Would you like to have a go? Get you looking into the mirror. Get me so we can see you. Can you are you the right height? Yes, okay, we can see you and the mirror. And what I'm going to do is to turn the mirror through 90 degrees. What do you think you'll see? Whoopsie. <laughs> He's wrong side up. <laughs> Bend down a little lower if you can. Can you see that he's, he's wrong side up, isn't he? Touch the top of your head. One way up there. Which hand did you use? Left. Left hand. Is he left handed in the mirror as well? Yes, I see. Yes. The thing is, you see that... Thank you very much. In that position, you get two 180 degree turns from two reflections with the common line vertical. When you turn it that way, you get one of each. So you really can cheat the mirrors and see yourself as you really are or get up-down reversal. You can't avoid it all, of course. Now, let's look at the capital letters of the alphabet for a minute and see if it gives us a clue to this camel cigarettes and to the, the code. Those capital letters are all the ones in the alphabet that have left-right symmetry. <coughs> means if I offer a mirror to any one, then you can see it just as if it were the whole letter. Each one of those has got left-right symmetry and there are 11 of them. Now, we can make from those letters a sort of code like that. That doesn't mean much at the moment. It would mean more if I put it in the vertical, and it means still more if I hold it against a mirror and turn the mirror around in such a way that you can see the other half. Okay. You'll, find, you'll have fun seeing whether your Christian names will do this. For example, Timothy will do this, and George will not. You'll soon find out whether your name can be spelt out of those letters. That's what it really boils down to. And then, of course, there is another set of letters which have the other kind of symmetry. These letters are symmetrical top-bottom. So if I turn them that way, and I run down them with the mirror, you will see that I can reproduce the letters simply by splitting them in half. I don't even have to do that, I just simply have to take the mirror there. And all these letters appear just as they are, you see, in the mirror. Until I get down here, I'll go back to the centre again, and I approach the letter S. Oh dear! The letter S isn't one of them, is it? It doesn't belong there. Looks like a figure three. And the letter Z, of course, is also a stranger in this company. 
So there aren't really 11, there are only nine. You will notice, however, that among the nine, I can choose the letters C-H-O-I-C-E. Choice. Quality. That's how it was done. It's nothing to do with the cellophane. If I turn choice quality wrong side up, put it in front of the mirror, when I've done that, I've really rotated it. So I've not only put it upside down, I've put it left right as well. And the mirror puts the left right right. So choice is happy and quality is far from happy. <laughs> now, the second puzzle. These are nothing more than our friends, the figures one, two, three. This one I have to go over there. Four, five, six, and seven. So the next ones in the series were, of course, eight and nine. That would have been a giveaway. You'd have seen the eight straight away. I don't know how many of you have seen that before. It is rather an old chestnut. But it is relevant to our study of top-bottom symmetry and left-right symmetry. Well, now... How to give your projectionist, if you're a lecturer, how to give your projectionist a nervous breakdown? <laughs> Normally, I always understood it was the projectionist who gave the lecturer a nervous breakdown. By sticking the slides in. You see, he's got all sorts of mistakes he can make. He can... Is that she do with a white card? Oh, it's dirty, thank you. He can push a slide into a projector in eight possible ways. One, two, three... Four, and then if he's got drunk, he can put them in backwards and do another four. And two of those will be right. They are, in fact, four pairs. There are only four different images that he'll get. But I've got eight different images here. And I'm going to try these out on you. And you are to say, mentally to yourself, whether you think this is a real slide or not. <coughs> it is a picture of a cube. It is the letters that are important. Figure three, a cube. That's what you hope to get. The projectionist put this one on next. And you shouted, wrong way around. And he turned it round, and he got it wrong again. Wrong way around, you call again. And the man frantically putting it in. I'll give you a clue. That one cannot be put right by inversion, reversal, top, bottom, or anything. That is an, a fictitious piece of writing. What about that one? Before you had time to settle down with that, what about that? <laughs> then have a go at that. You wouldn't think they were all this number, would you? There's another. Yeah. And another. Number eight coming up. Who thinks that one's all right? No takers. Put your hand up if you think it's all right. My goodness, you're a bit slow on the uptake, aren't you? You're only going to turn it over. <laughs> you see, it was the others that threw you. You got into the habit of saying, no, that can't be right, that can't be right. I'll go through them again, and I'll give you a clue as to which is right. That one, of course, was right. That's what we're trying to do. That one, as I said, you'll never get right. This one. What about that? That's all right. If you turn that over and then did that with it, it would be right. Because you, the clue is that the F of the fig is pointing inwards, pointing the right way. Look at the next. You'll never make much of that because the F is pointing outwards and it shouldn't be. If you've latched onto a clue already, it's the F that'll give you a clue. That can't be right either for the same reason. That can. Because the F is pointing inwards. The cube looks sort of all right up upside down, but then you've seen choice already. That one's okay. That one's not. The F is pointing outwards. That one is all right. As I said, you simply have to turn it over. So, the next time you have to give a lecture, try a slide made like that. You'll find that advertising these days, is, this sort of stuff's got onto the posters. You'll see posters advertising products, and they've got one or two of the letters reversed. This is supposed to catch your eye. But the most important eye-catcher at the moment of this kind is a very useful thing, which 
You see, if you're driving a car and you're looking through your rear view mirror and you see an ambulance behind you and you're suddenly surprised that it actually reads ambulance. Now this is very useful because it means you pull over, mate, this chap's coming fast in a hurry. So that is a very common use of that particular kind of inversion. Now another party trick with a common object. It's never common enough for most of us, but I, I've managed to keep one or two back just to be able to show you. <laughs> Um, the folding and unfolding of a pound note. Take the pound note firmly in the fingers and fold it about a horizontal axis, lifting the bottom of the note up to the top. And fold it. I'm not a conjurer, it's straightforward what you see. Now fold it about a vertical axis, like that. Now we're ready to unfold it. Unfold it about a vertical axis, that can't be doing much to it except making left go right. And now unroll it in the way you rolled it up, that's to say push the front downwards and it's wrong side up. Now that appears to be more of a mystery than if I'd done it the other way. If I had begun by doing a vertical fold and then I'd said bring up the bottom and then take down the back, you'd said, ah, oh, just a minute, you're turning it over. And then of course when I unfolded it, it would in fact be seen to be upside down. That wouldn't have been so mystifying. It's why you can fold it, taking the bottom to the top, and why, without an apparent rolling action at all, you can just do that, and then unroll it in the same way you rolled it up. Um, well, now, these were, in a way, a few facts about what we might call ordinary mirrors. Now, but what about the extraordinary mirrors? What about mirrors that exist in the mind? Things we see as reflections, which are either sequences of events, or even more way out than that. We're going to illustrate this by means of a chess game. Now, Lewis Carroll wrote the whole of the story of Alice Through the Looking Glass as if it were a game of chess. And Alice was a pawn and she tried throughout the book to win her way through to the opposite side and become a queen. Now this time we're going to have a most remarkable act because on my left we have no less a person than Boris Spassky. Sit down boy. <laughs> oh no, you're... Oh, you're not... Who's Spassky? You're Spassky and you are Fisher. All right. Now... These are, you are to believe that these are the two grandmasters themselves playing a world championship match. They're going to be taken on simultaneously. Someone is going to play two games of chess at once against the two best in the world. He's only nine years old. Come on, Dennis, come and stand in the middle. Right, the only thing that Dennis asks is that he is allowed to dictate the order of play. And he says, Mr. Spassky, you're playing white. You must move first, then I will move on Mr. Fisher's board, then Mr. Fisher will reply, and then Mr. Spassky, I will reply on his board. So, Mr. Spassky, would you like to move first? These are the moves that were used in the World Championship game, in one of the games. Dennis copies the move onto that board and says, Mr. Fisher, you reply. Fisher replies leading that pawn. Dennis replies on the other board. Fisher plays again. Dennis copies the move. And Spassky other. Fisher plays again. And Dennis copies the move. Now, can you see at that stage what is happening? Dennis is going to be able to guarantee to, to beat one of the world's grandmasters or to draw with them both. <laughs> because he's not playing at all. He's reflecting the moves of one onto the other. Those two middle sets of chessmen could go. Spassky is playing Fisher, and Dennis is the mirror in between. Can you see what I mean by a metaphorical mirror? When you think of it on the face of it, that, that a boy of nine could play the two world masters and guarantee to beat one of them or to draw with both. That's a fair old feat, Dennis. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, so now we come to uh, the broader sense of mirrors. It must have occurred to you by now that I couldn't really go on showing you new fantastic mirrors for another five hours, another five lectures after this. 
And you'd be right, I couldn't. But about this wider view of mirrors, where you can have reflections and this and that, we'll make a start with palindromes. Now, a palindrome is a word or a sentence. It's a sequence of letters or a sequence of words which reads the same forwards as backwards. The first thing that Adam's supposed to have said to Eve was, Madam, I'm Adam. Could we just have a look at this in the mirror, Bill? This is not a true palindrome in the sense that if we look at it in a mirror, let me see it in the mirror, there we are. Not like, how was I? That's it. Further away. No, the card. No, to me, that's it. <laughs> right, gotcha. Now, do you notice that the D is the wrong way around in the reflection? Only the D is the wrong way around. Turn the mirror, that's better. Got it. Got it, yep. Only the Ds are the wrong way around. Otherwise, it would have been a perfect palindrome. But you can have fun without making them perfect. Incidentally, of course, the, the, the reply to that was also palindromic. She said Eve. Well, um, Napoleon was also said to make a palindrome when he complained that Abel was I ere I saw Elba. And you'll notice at once that each word now has a complete reversal. Elba reverses as Abel, was, saw, I, I, and ear in the middle here. But not all palindromes need be like that. You can get more complex ones. And another historical one was said of Disraeli, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Going backwards, you have to split up Panama. More, more, it's the wrong way. <laughs> That's the trouble of looking in monitors, you see, instead of mirrors. Um, you have to make a man, a plan. You see, the words don't divide. Now, in my Manchester days, I was privileged to know the late Alan Turing, mathematical genius. And he created palindromes, I know. It was one of the things that fascinated him. And he made one of what must surely be the world's longest palindromes, and I'm sure he made it up himself. He had a little story to tell about it. It's an American who's discussing the question of losing weight with his general practitioner. In America, he walks into his office and doesn't say, good morning, doctor. He says, hi, doc. Well, if you'll accept doc as a word, then here comes the palindrome about the diet. Doc, note, I dissent. A fast never prevents a fatness. I diet on God. <laughs> Just have a look at that for a, for a front-back reversal. Now, Alan Turing, as I said, was a genius, and one of the things he did was to produce the most amazing solution to what has been known traditionally now for a while as the three weighings problem. There are 12 coins, which I'm going to put down here in order. These are supposed to be 12 equal coins of equal weight, but one of them is a fake. And the faked one is either heavier or lighter than each of the others. That's the fake. We've labelled it so that you shall know which it is. You have a balance on which you can only put piles of these. You've no extra weight. And of course, if you were to put one of them on and weigh it against the others, you'd very soon find out which was the fake. But the question is, how can you do it if you're only allowed three weighings? In a, I mean, if you take that one away against that, you get equality, and you've used up one weighing already. You're not going to get very far, are you? How do you do it in 12, in, in, do the 12 coins in three weighings only? Well, there, you could work at it for years, you know. But Alan Turing's solution was this. He said... It's like a little boy. This little boy wanted to go out and play in the rain, and his mother didn't really want him to. So he said, uh, she said, you can go out and play, provided you solve this problem. And she gave him the problem. Now, the little boy's name was Freddy. F for Freddy. And he was getting desperate and thinking he wasn't going to get any play at all. And finally, he wrote down on a piece of paper... F for Freddy, am not licked. He wasn't beaten. He wrote down F, am not licked. 
And then he wrote another piece of paper. Ma, that's his mother. Ma, do like me to find fake coin. For there is the recipe for the discovery of the three weighings. Those 12 letters there are all different. And they appear on here. So weighing number one, you take M-A-D-O. You go to here and you take M-A-D-O. And that is on that side of the balance. On this side, L-I-K-E. L-I-K-E. Now you see this one's got the fake in. So when he puts them on the balance, he gets what you would call right hand down. Now you don't know whether the fake coin is lighter or heavier than it should be. All you know is that you've got a right hand down. You, that's weighing number one. You then perform similarly, you take these off and you start again and you put on the letters M-E-T-O on this side, F-I-N-D there. So you'll get three results. They'll either be left down, right down or equal. And then you have a set of formulae, which we've scribbled out rather quickly. And you look at these, if you can get these a little closer, perhaps they can see them, that's the thing. And you look for the one that we found. And in our case, we had right equal left. And that tells you that K was the fake coin and it was heavy. You have all the 24 possibilities there, there is no repetition on there. That, as far as I'm concerned, is the only way I'll ever solve that problem. Now, although this had nothing to do with mirrors, I did want to show you this because it is a, a, a fact, you can see it before your eyes, that a man can devise a sequence of words that together make up a sentence, and not just any sentence, but a sentence relevant to the problem of the weighings, using only two and four letter words so that the, the four letter words were never subdivided about the dividing line. And this, to me, is a tribute to the brain of a man. And I, for one, am delighted to be classed as belonging to the same species as that man. It was a fantastic piece of work. You may say, it doesn't get you anywhere. It shows the ability of your brain. Well, now, from top, bottom, and left-right symmetry, I've left one out. I call it skew symmetry. It is the symmetry of rotation. That is, in a way, a palindromic number, because I can do that with it. It'll be 1961 either way up. Not a true palindrome, but a rotational one. The last true palindromic year was 1881, and the next one will be 1991. And this brings in the subject of number palindromes, and again, my good friend Martin Gardner. He said, take any two-digit number, 89. Write its palindrome, 98, and add them up, 17, 18. Is the answer a palindromic number? No. Nope. Then reverse it, 781, and add it up. Is the result a palindromic number? No. Reverse it. Add it up. He went on to do this 24 times and came out with the fantastic number 8813200023188 after 24 editions. Then he asked this problem. Is it inevitable that all numbers will ultimately become palindromic by these means? A Californian mathematician found that of the first 10,000 numbers, only 249 had not yielded a palindrome within 100 editions. But suppose he'd had a better computer and he'd gone beyond the 100 editions. The answer to that question is not known. So if any of you fancy a chance to take out your mini computer you can buy these days, put that program on and get on with it, you may discover the rule that every number will ultimately become a palindrome if you keep treating it in that way. Well now, from Lewis Carroll's Looking Glass House, she, Alice looked out into a garden. We're going to show you Alice's garden. She went into the garden down a flight of steps such as this. And Lewis Carroll said, that she didn't have to walk down the steps, 
she simply floated down the steps as it were on a magic carpet. Well, when she got to the bottom, she looked into the garden, which is all inside here, so you can't see it, and she saw a nice straight path. Now, although you can't see it, our camera one can see it, he's looking into the garden. And so if you look on the monitor, you'll watch him. Alice is right at the end of the garden, you see. And she's a long way away. He has to zoom in on Alice. You can zoom out again. And it was a more or less straight line. But when Alice went down there and walked, she said, it's all crooked. Now, why was it crooked when it looked straight? Well, we're going to show you what the magic garden was really like. And we're going to take off the sides. And you see, it was full of mirrors. Camera number one is looking into that mirror, bouncing off there onto that mirror, onto that one, onto that one, and onto Alice herself at the far end. This is why it was a crooked path that looked straight. Now Lewis Carroll said Alice floated down the steps. I'm going to go one better than Lewis Carroll. I'm going to make Alice go back up the steps and float all the way. Okay. There you go, Alice. Up the steps you go. <laughs> now, you heard the buzzing sound and you probably recognise I've got some electromagnetic device under here. Take the top off. There's rather a lot of stuff under there, but there is really only one row of coils. And this thing we call a magnetic river. Now you're going to see this again more in lecture five, but I thought it'd be nice today if we showed you that it wasn't an illusion and that the magic carpet was disguised with felt. It is in fact a sheet of aluminium. Okay, Mary. Yep. So we did manage one thing better than Lewis Carroll. Well now, there are all sorts of things I haven't shown you really about ordinary mirrors still. The things we've been looking at, apart from the chimpanzee and the dog, have all been dead things, not in the main moving. Now we'll look at, at a spinning wheel. Look at a spinning wheel in the mirror and it goes the same way in both mirror and this world. And yet, if I do that with it, it doesn't. Now, here's a thing for us, isn't it? There, you've got two wheels going in opposite directions. There, you've got them going in the same direction. And suppose we turn it this way. They're still going in opposite directions. Now surely that needs a lot of explaining, doesn't it? Where was the flip-over point between that situation and that one? Where did you stop seeing it going round the same way? I think the answer is almost as soon as I moved. But it reminded me of another standard trick using a drawing like this. You know, when you look at it long enough, you start seeing those bits coming out or going in, and the more you look at it, the more you see it differently and you realize there's some trick being played on the human eye and so it is with wheels <coughs> this machine is supposed to represent an electric motor driving an electric generator these two wheels are motor and generator to make this into a motor i'm going to be the motor i'm going to turn the handle and to make this generator do some work and produce some electricity that will put a drag on it, and I put a drag on it in the form of a friction brake, just for simplicity. If I hold the generator still and try to dr and switch the motor on, then the motor distorts, like that, those elastic bands which are connecting the two together. Those are the shaft, if you like. And the direction of the bands on this side says, if I'm doing the turning, then this is the motor and that's the generator. But look in the mirror. If you couldn't see my hand, I pull it out, then you would swear that the other one was the motor because that is the one 
in which the bands are, so to speak, leading, if you thought that was going to go round the same way as this. So here's our second hint that you might, in the mirror, have some curious reversal of time. Because this gets you involved into things that spin, and things that spin in opposite directions. And in modern physics, the, di the difference between matter and antimatter is simply a question of direction of spin. So maybe this is the world, uh, or rather the other side of the mirror through which I came is the world, and this is the anti-world, and yet this illusion, and it is an illusion, is shattered once I let these rotate. I'm going to rotate the motor and let the generator follow. Now I don't know if you can see, but in the mirror, it's obvious which is doing the pulling. It's me all the time, isn't it? Whether it's in this side of the mirror or the other. Because this is the one seen to be leading, because the rotation is apparently reversed. So what happens if we do that? Once again, it's obvious that the one with the handle is doing the pulling because that one is leading. And yet that was the way in which they're both going down the same direction. This thing has mystified many of you when you've been taught Fleming's left and right hand rules. You had to repeat like a parrot thumb motion Four-finger field and second-finger current. Now, was that a motor or a generator? That one's the other one. <laughs> and you see, there is the mystery, because that is a picture of a right hand. So in the mirror, it'll do for the, for the generator, and in this side of the mirror, it'll do for the motor. So there is some magic in it after all. Now, I'd like to give you a problem to try yourselves when you get home. You cut from brown paper, the three letters, M, U, D, and make them nice and symmetrical. No tails on them. Nice and left-right symmetry. This one doesn't have left-right symmetry, but it doesn't have a tail on either. And you write the word mud. Some of you are ahead of me, I think. Because if you looked at that through a mirror, of course you'd see that unacceptable 20 years ago word on television, bum. Now, this is the problem. I want you to make one of those at home, take it into a dark room at night, and shine a torch onto the letters. From the letters, you'll get a reflection back over your head onto the back wall. You'll see the shadows of those letters on the back wall. So, facing that way, shining the torch, I want you to tell me, when you turn around and look at the wall, shall you read mud or bum? One for you to try. Now, one more demonstration, which is, for this lecture, the big one. We shall have one big demonstration, I hope, in each lecture. And this one is quite the most fantastic mirror I've ever seen of any kind. Are you right? It is made of this same magic material that's so light and flexible. This mirror at the moment is a plain mirror. You should be able to see yourselves through it. I want you to notice especially the difference between myself, not through the mirror, and yourselves through the mirror. That's the shot. Now, Barry, switch on the pump. And we're so accustomed to zoom lenses on television these days, giving us close-ups. I do want you to realize that this is not a trick of the cameraman. This is not a zoom lens in operation at all. Because I am not getting smaller or bigger. It's only those people in the mirror, the stairs and so on, and if you stand very close to this mirror, as I'm doing, you don't care to look into it for too long, because you get rather sort of seasick. <laughs> this was a mirror made for Sir Barnes Wallace, who demonstrated it at a soiree at the Royal Society in 1966. Now, I want you to see, whilst you're watching this, that there are so many ways of using the word reflection without it meaning 
what you see in a mirror. The word reflection has been extended in literature to cover all sorts of uses. In novels, one finds phrases such as, he reflected that he had once observed that so-and-so. It doesn't mean he was a mirror and he reflected. <laughs> it means he sort of looked back over his life. Reflection, if one thinks of a time reflection, it's really only a reversal of a sequence of events. And when you're seeing things go backwards, you're only playing backwards, as it were, on the tape, things which were recorded forwards. Then again, you'll read, his smile reflected his good humour. How did he do that? <laughs> I hope that you will all be in a very good humour when we meet again for lecture two, because there I shall introduce you to Mr. Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They are Lewis Carroll's symbols for left and right. We shall deal with more with left and right handedness and we shall wander through this looking glass land and I hope you'll all join me again next time.